questions haunt every life, writes Andy Crouch. The first, what are we meant to be? And the second, why are we so far from what we're meant to be? Hello and welcome to Restoring the Soul, a podcast dedicated to helping you close the gap from what you're meant to be and what keeps you from being all that. I'm your producer, Brian Beatty. Thank you for listening. On this edition of Restoring the Soul, Michael welcomes Susie Larson to the podcast. Susie is a talk radio host, national speaker, and best-selling author. She hosts the daily talk show, Susie Larson Live, which airs on the Faith Radio Network. It reaches a half million people weekly through her daily posts on Facebook. Now, Today, she and Michael will discuss the essence of her latest book, Fully Alive, Learning to Flourish, Mind, Body, and Spirit. Now, in it, Susie shows how intertwined our emotional, spiritual, and physical health are. Spiritual difficulties can have physical consequences, and physical illnesses can have emotional and even spiritual ramifications. So, in order for true healing to occur, it must happen holistically. Now, this discussion is packed full of advice, practical strategy to overcome your fears and start walking confidently with God. He is accessible and available to you today. Now, one final note, Susie has graciously provided us a copy of Fully Alive that we'll send to a randomly selected listener. And all you need to do to qualify is log into Apple Podcasts and write a review of Restoring the Soul. We'd love to hear from you. So join us next week for the conclusion of their discussion, and we'll be sure to let you know who wins. So without any further delay, here's your host, Michael John Cusick. So Susie Larson, I want to welcome you to the Restoring the Soul podcast. Michael, so good to be with you. We are kindred spirits. I know that already, so I'm so grateful to get this time with you. Yeah, this is our second time uh, seeing each other on Zoom. We have a mutual friend, Jim, a.k.a. James Brian Smith in Wichita, and we had a chance to talk there. But you had shared about your book, Fully Alive, Learning to Flourish, Mind, Body, and Spirit. And as soon as I saw the subtitle, because after we met last time, I went to your website. I love what you're doing. You're all about restoration. You're all about bringing the good news to people in a way that uh, that really sets them free. This book emerged out of your own unexpected season. You've battled a lot of health issues over a long period of time, but you had a, a kind of unexpected reemergence of that that led you to dive into the contents of this book. So can you talk about that? Yeah, that, that's an important question. So people have context about where I'm coming from, because if you read any of my books or listen to any of the stuff that I do with my radio show, you'll notice sort of a language of contending for the things God has promised us, because that's just how it's sort of gone for me. And uh, just to give a quick little backstory of my journey so you understand where I'm coming from, I was raised in a large family in a denomination where I knew God was real. I absolutely knew God was real, but I didn't know Jesus was accessible. And I was a pretty insecure, kind of sweet little rule following girl, afraid of things at times. And when I was about nine years old, I was pinned down by some teenage boys in our neighborhood and, and uh, experienced a sexual trauma at the hands of these boys. And I got up from that incident, very confused about what happened and whose fault that was. So I didn't tell anybody till I was about 18 years old. That was nine years old. When I was 10 years old, I was coming home from school and that's just a short little four foot thing. And a uh, different group of teenage boys must've been high on something. Cause all I remember they're sitting in the dugout. I walked by this baseball diamond and they ran out and chased me down and beat me up real bad. And I remember they had this crazed, look in their eye and they were laughing wildly as they kicked me and punched me and pulled fistfuls of hair. And I'm like curled in a ball, screaming, crying. And they just laughed as they pummeled me when they were done with me and they walked away laughing to each other. I got up and I had a snarled hair and a fat lip and scratches on my face and a sore gut. <laughs> and uh, I remember hearing in my ear, it wasn't audible, but it might as well have been. I can get to you anytime, anywhere, and God will never stop me. And as a little girl at that moment, I knew God was real and I knew the devil was real. And I often say when I'm speaking to women at conferences that the enemy sees your potential long before you ever do. You just got to go look at your childhood. The first moments you knew you weren't enough or that you were felt afraid. And you could see that his threat against you is very connected to your threat against him. 
And so that's when fear entered my life. And fear has been something I've had to contend with in huge ways over the years. And I will confess to you that, Michael, that I'm not fearless now. I'm not fearless. I've got a ways to go, but I've come a long way. But you jump ahead as a young Christian mom. You know, it's like I, when I went into middle school and high school, I became a performer because it's just be, I had such a canyon of insecurity in my soul that, you know, I, I was athletic and I had other gifts. And so I kind of used those to dig myself out of a hole that I believed that I was in. And, you know, we do that. We, we misuse our time, treasure and talents to prove something Jesus has already proven when we don't know who we are. And I just didn't know who I was. And I came to Christ in eighth grade. But at that point, I, I knew I was saved, but I still didn't know I was loved. And I will take that all the way into as a young mom and wife. I transferred all that performing into being a super Christian. You know, I was on five committees and I was just trying to do it all right. I was passionate. I loved Jesus. But again, I didn't really know that he loved me. And so enter into that season of, I was my third pregnancy. I was on bed rest for six months with a one and a three-year-old and going in and out of the hospital to stop labor. And I, I had to call in all my friend favors and they were all getting tired of me and I was tired of me. And so this, it was like, Michael, it was like God cleared the deck so I could see a major crack in my foundation because I couldn't earn my way anyway. I, 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 you know, it's like people were getting tired of helping me. and It was confronting all these incredible fears and insecurities in me. And long story short, one day during that bed rest, the docs let me get up and uh, test the waters. And uh, I went for a walk with some old college roommates, had lunch. I was six months pregnant, back in bed by night because it didn't work. I had to go back to bed rest. But within two weeks of that outing, my face went numb. I started to have some neurological fireworks in my body and I still had three months to go on this pregnancy, delivered my son and my health plummeted. And over that next year, they thought MS, brain tumor, they didn't know what was wrong. And then they discovered a year later it was Lyme disease and traced it back to my one day out. Um, That began years of army crawling through the valley as a young Mm. mom. But I also have a fitness background. And even after my illness, I went back to teaching group fitness classes And it was hard, but I had to do it for the fight in me. So before the relapse that you're talking about, you know, I'm a woman of God's word and I'm fighting for that. You know, I'm a health minded person. So I'm fighting for my health and I believe God is who he says he is. But my journey was very, you know, twists and turns, two steps forward, three steps back. And I even remember back then the Lord whispered to my heart, Susie, I could heal you today, but you'd lose it tomorrow. And I'm like, I'll come. (laughs) And he said, because you don't have the infrastructure for healing. You think like a sick person. And with neurological diseases, they're so terrifying. And the symptoms are so all over the place. You can be, and then as a person who battled fear, I was constantly led on wild goose chases with what was going on in these crazy symptoms and my fears. So jump ahead. You know, I'd kind of hit a plane for the last 20 years. I found a way to manage. It's a chronic health issue, but I found a way to manage and gotten a lot done in my life and had a massive relapse five years ago. And I noticed symptoms were coming up and usually a couple times a year, they would flare and I would have to pull in and get rest and do what I need to do to kind of level things out. I thought it was that, but it just kept escalating. And so one day I was getting ready to head to the radio station and neurological fireworks went off in my body. My arms went numb, my neck went numb, my whole head went numb, my vision blurred and the room started to spin. And it used to be back when my face would go numb as a young mom, it was like Satan had me by the face going, where's your God now? And I I was young enough in my faith, I didn't have an answer. Well, this time I felt like he had me by the throat because everything was going numb. It was a terrifying moment. And I remember going, I'm begging you, God, don't make me go around this mountain again. At this age, I'm begging you not to let me fight this fight. At this point in my life, I just couldn't believe it. And the Lord whispered to my heart, the storms reveal the lies we believe and the truths we need. And, I, and it was, if, if you could peel back the sky, Michael, you could have seen a spiritual war zone in my bathroom because I could feel the, just the trauma fear coming at me from the enemy going, I've got you now. So in that moment, I'm like, I, I, the chaos was surrounding me. I could hear the whisper and I knew it was the Lord. I'm like, okay, what is the lie that I believe? And it came back to me. The enemy was railing in my ear. I can get you anytime, anywhere, and God will never stop me. And Michael, what I realized, I believe I'm a seasoned believer. I'm a serious believer. At this stage in my life, I realized I had this subconscious belief in the depths of my soul that the storm brought up that I have to endure everything I fear, that there really is no limit to what the enemy can get away with in my life. And when I 
heard that in my ear. The Lord whispered to me and said, Susie, do you know that's not true? That he doesn't get to you anytime, anywhere. He's on his short leash. And we don't outrun lies. We turn around and face them. You can't even imagine how I've provided in your life. You don't even know what I've prevented in your life. I'm not going to let you lose, but I have to let you fight this battle. And I just, and the fight I did. That I mean, I'm still on my way out of it. It's been five years. I'm about 85% recovered, but it was a D-Day battle for me. That storm revealed an embedded lie in my soul. And I say all that to say, and that's what Fully Live was born out of, is, you know, I, I'm a disciplined person. I remember just going, I'm, you know, even my doctors have said, nobody fights like you do because I have stuff I want to do. But even so, God kept leading me to this passage in scripture where the man had been on the mat for 38 years. And Jesus says, do you want to get well? And I'm like, God, why do you keep bringing me back? Of course, I, I mean, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm just listing all of the ways physically and spiritually that I'm contending for this. And the man's response to Jesus after 38 years was, I can't, sir. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and then I realized maybe I have some I can'ts in my own soul. So I asked the Lord, show me. Are there things in me that are embedded down, down deep that are hindrances to my own healing process. All of that to say, Michael, it's a long-winded answer. I really do believe we all have hindrances. We get in our own way even at times, and we have subconscious beliefs that we pick up from trauma, hardships, and those kinds of things that get in the way of our flourishing. And if we could be open and trust, not fear the storm, to trust, that that storm will bring that stuff up. And, it, and instead of being offended and hurt by God that he allowed another storm, look at it as an opportunity where the enemy has overplayed his hand so God can position you for freedom. I mean, look for what is shaking and what's not shaking. What is surfacing? Because God wants to extract that thing from you so that he can give you a greater capacity for healing. Wow. Thank you for sharing all of that. As soon as we had a chance to talk in our very first meeting, I, I had an immediate sense of trust in you because you had shared a, a briefer overview of your story. And you're not sitting behind a microphone on your radio show or in your ministry speaking platitudes that you'd like to think are true, that you've literally contended for these out of your own valley, as you said. There's two things that you you mentioned almost in passing that I want to come back to. And the first thing you said that you personally and help others to contend for the things of God that he has for us. And my experience is as a, as a therapist that a lot of folks who need restoration and who have contended and not gotten what they need and want, they feel as if fighting and contending is something that they can't do and that it often ties into or feels like having to earn their salvation. Uh, Dallas Willard said once the grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. And so how do you live in that fine balance, contending and fighting between the earning and the effort that's need to show up day to day when you're trying to get to a healthier place. Fantastic, fantastic question. And just for the record, you know, I have uh, doctors on my show every month and, and they will tell you, especially if you have a chronic issue, a chronic health issue, or even emotional relational issue, there are times to see striving to stop and pull back and rest, get into the rest of God. But for me, I was living in that tension going, there are times I'm exhausted from this battle. There are other times that I'm, I'm fearful. There's other times you've given me the grace to go for, but I need a strategy because God seemed so silent in the first parts of that battle for me. And I said, give me a strategy. Give me something I can grab hold of. And I offer this in the book, and I think this might be a word for somebody, but because I really do believe it's so nuanced, Michael. I think for all of us, if we're walking in step with the Spirit, there may be a day, he says, run. Then he might be a day he says, hold your ground, stand. Another day he may say, tuck under my wing and rest a while. It's not a formula, but these steps for me, just they were interchangeable, but they were strategies. You rest while I work, you feast while I fight, and you wait to take flight. And I'm going to unpack those if I can. You rest while I work. When you get into a restless place where you are uh, striving and it's, you think it's more up to you than it is up to God, then I point him to Psalm 4610. And it says, cease striving or be still and know that I am God. And be still, cease striving, the way that that unpacks or translates is a number of things. One of them is to let go, to sink down, 
to relax, and in some cases, to be quiet. So when you think of the areas of soul unrest, maybe it's your finances, where you're tempted to just go get a third job, even if God's not asking, you're taking things into your own hands, and there's a flurry around it. It takes a lot of faith to let go, to sink down into the Father's love, to even relax about it, because you think, especially if you're hyper-responsible, like I am, that you're not caring by letting go and relaxing in the love of God. And then in some cases, to be quiet, I think that's a good word for us because there's times where our own words testify against the very promises of God because we're rehearsing, rehashing, rehearsing, and there's physiological implication to what we are constantly saying. This isn't name it, claim it, but I am saying doctors and scientists will tell you the stuff you rehearse and rehash actually affects your DNA. I mean, it's really as far as what you're handing down to future generations. It's really quite mind boggling. So, let go, sink down, relax, and then know, be still and know that I'm God is an experiential knowing, an encountering of the living God. So imagine in those places of soul unrest where you suddenly go, okay, I've taken this into my own hands. I'm going to sink down into the Father's love. I want to encounter you, God, in the area of finances or in the area of health. So there's times where that was my strategy. You rest while I work. The next one is you feast while I fight. When I'm feeling bullied and battered by the enemy and he seems bigger than Christ in me, I go to communion. I go to the table because in Psalm 23, it says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And that table is the king's table for king's use by invitation only. I want you to think about that. If you are in Christ, right on your battlefield, Jesus marches onto that battlefield in the face of your enemy, which is his enemy, and sets up a royal table, a banquet. So it's you feast while I fight. I mean, you you rest while I work. So this is where God's taking things. You feast while I fight. So there's times when the enemy had come against me and I'm like, you know what? I'm eating, (laughs) Go talk to the father. And I would just banquet in the riches of God and go, I'm just not going to fight this right now. I'm going to be still and let God fight for me. And then you wait to take flight. And Isaiah talks about those who wait on the Lord will find a new strength and a new power. That means a power and a strength you've not yet known or experienced. And I think to get a fresh expectancy of what that might look like. So, and, and it's active waiting, not passive waiting. So for me, those were strategies where I would say, Lord, what I would just kind of pay attention to where's my soul today. And I would enter in, in that way. Now, maybe those would be helpful, but maybe God will give you your own, but I just don't, I think we like plans and we like to, you know, tell me how to do this day in and day out. But I just think it's a nuanced journey, but that dependence and listening to the Lord is a beautiful part of walking with God. Yeah. And the tension between being and doing, there are still are ways that we can practice and posture ourselves and our lives to aid to that being. So I love how concrete that is. All of this is really immersed in something that you said right at the beginning that when you were little, you knew God was real, but you didn't know he was accessible. And one of the things that I feel as part of my calling is helping to teach believers that he is accessible and how accessible he is. So there might be somebody listening or maybe many people, and and this was part of my journey, that hearing you talk and say, yeah, that all sounds great, but I try to feel the Father's love or to sit at the table and I don't feel very fed. And of course, those are the old lies. That's the trauma that's embodied. But talk about what you mean by that he's accessible and how somebody can begin to move into that Hmm. so that they can experience this restoration. I I so understand that lament. I get it so much. I live there and I've experienced that. And I remember uh, the game changing moment for me was as a young mom battling this disease. And I'd already used up my friend favors with all those, that bed rest. So then when I was army crawling through sickness, there were times I couldn't do it. And I still had to call a few friends, but I tried to do a lot of it on my own just because I needed to. Um, um, We didn't have money for extra help and all that. But so here I am. I, I remember just going before God, really lamenting, going, I can't do more than I'm doing as a young Christian mom, because I have three little boys, a disease, but I'm still And I I wasn't doing this to earn God's favor, but I was pursuing God. I'm like, I'm memorizing scripture. I'm in the word. I'm listening for your voice. I don't know what else I can do because what's hard for me is I get up from this place 
And I'm the same insecure, fearful person I was when I started. I mean, where's the victory that I read about? I, I'm, I still care what people think about me. I'm still terrified of another trauma happening. I still feel like you lost my address. So where is the victory? And the Lord broke through that silence and said, Susie, I get that you love me, but you don't seem to get that I love you. So until I tell you differently, every time you want to say, I love you, Lord, I want you to turn it around and say, you love me, Lord. Say it now. And I said, you love me, Lord. And it felt like a foreign language in my mouth. And then I would blow up at my kids and then feel bad about it. And I and he, hear the whispers, say it now. You can hear you love me, Lord. I heard it over and over and over again. And I applied that. I just started to say, you know, Lord, you love me. You love me. And then I wondered, is this some kind of self-help, you know, be the best <laughs> you can be, you know, but it's in scripture. It's not that we loved God. It's that he loved us. It's not how high we can jump. It's that he stooped down to make us great. That's what scripture says. And uh, this is a, a bad paraphrase of something Soren Kierkegaard once said is Jesus not only loved us first that first time, but he loves us first every single day. And, I, you know, I, I've had a, a brain scientist on my show when he gave our listeners uh, assignment. And he said, if you were to spend 15 minutes a day pondering the father's love, nothing else. And your brain might wander, but bring it back. If you were to spend 15 minutes a day immersing yourself in scripture about the father's love and thinking in the ways he's shown you his love and considering the fact that he smiles over you, he said it would literally change your brain and it would bring healing to the cells in your body. And I think one of the reasons we don't feel it is because we are more obsessed with our weakness than we are with his strength, you know, with the ways that we fail rather than the ways that he comes through. And there's something to be said about rejecting rejection and accepting acceptance. I mean, I finally had to take the leap of faith to believe that I'm someone he wants at the party. You know, I just finally had to go, I'm going to accept acceptance. It's so foreign to me. I don't get it. It doesn't feel true, but I'm going to start living and believing and praying like it is true. I'm going to picture that when I come into his throne room, that he has a smile all the way up to his eyes. Like he's really glad to see me. I just had to start to renew my thoughts on the love of God. And it really, as you know, changes everything. I think it's so important to proclaim we really need to plant a flag in the ground and to say my body might feel anxious, uh, but I don't need to be afraid uh, that my body might be feeling utterly depressed. And yet there's a hope that I can't feel in my body. And I love how you talked about rejecting rejection. You know, let me just ask you a question because this has happened to me. The very first times going back about 20 years ago that I started to experience this experiential immersed in an accessible Jesus. I started to hear those things like, well, Michael, I love you. And I would have resistance to that. And so there's some ways, and I don't know if you would agree with this, but I, I suspect you would, that if we resist that thought, it's proof that it's all the more true. And that our bodies, because of the trauma or because of whatever physical suffering, I remember the first time I heard that, well, I love you, my body literally shook like I couldn't take that in. And that's because our vulnerability is so great in the trauma and the suffering that one of the things that's so scary is love. Love is terrifying in the sense that we're completely vulnerable, but love as defined in Jesus is completely trustworthy. I said a lot there, but did you, can you relate to that idea of the resistance? 100% yes. And you know, one of the things in Fully Live that I try to do is look at science and look at scripture. I'm fascinated by all of that. And you've heard this phrase, no doubt, nerves that fire together, wire together. So when you have an experience and then you have a neurological response to it, they wire together. And, and those traumas almost always underneath them are uh, not being loved, not being safe, the very things that heal our soul. So when we encounter love, it almost re-traumatizes us in a way because it's like, you mean I need to take a risk and, and, and untangle myself from this? You mean this isn't true? Because there's almost like a free fall moment where if you untangle from that and dare to trust God, you feel like I can't bear to be twice injured, so to speak. But that's one of the reasons some of the inner healing ministries are so important because they even help you visit, revisit some of these traumatic moments 
and, and see Jesus there and, and know that, that you are not alone and that God works all things somehow together for the good. And I, the people that I've seen that have gotten the greatest healing have thought, somehow been able to reframe even some of the things that happened in the past so that they can move forward. And, and you know, for me, uh, just because fear was such a massive thing for me, and it, I don't say it in past tense, it's still a, an issue for me in some ways. When I understood that what happens in our soul happens in our cells, that there are implications, because it's like, I think we live and settle with so much in our soul that we don't deal with. And we live with a low grade fever or a low level of misery. And it seems easier than daring to dig into the basement, the stuff we've been stuffing down there forever, you know, bring it back up. It's like, that seems too hard. It's not easier. It's hard work to keep stuff that's trying to get our attention shoved down into the basement. It's just different. And it, and I think it's more costly, but when you get to that place, for me, it was very motivating to understand what happens in my soul happens in my cells. I want to live. I have stuff I want to do. And one of the things two of my doctors had said to me, both believers, they said, Susie, because one of my issues is inflammation in my body, which was affecting my brain. And this relapse, by the way, was not Lyme. It was mold and it attacked my brain. I had seven areas of my brain that were either atrophied or swollen. Uh, I had a very bad MRI. It was having word find issues and I'm a communicator. So I, I would look at words and I couldn't spell them. Terrifying for me with, you know, anyway, they both said inflammation is so off the charts in your body, but you need to know every time that you allow fear in your soul, it actually opens the door to a cascade of inflammation in your body. We're working to bring down the inflammation, but we can't do anything about that fear. You have to do that. And when I looked at the science side of the implications of fear, it was the motivator for me because apart from that, fear was just a constant nemesis that I could not overcome. But when I started to realize there are some things I can do to rewire my brain and I've got to shut the door on this thing because I want to live and I've got to reduce this inflammation. That was super motivating for me. And I don't know if that helps you listening today, but when you think that there's a cellular response to what happens in your soul, I pray that that gives you a vision to go. I want, this is why we're not compartmentalized people. We are mind, body, spirit. We're a whole fearfully, wonderfully made person. Jesus did that on purpose. So when you care enough about your story and about your soul to believe there's always more, there's always more. And the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy, but Jesus comes that you have life and life abundant. I would challenge you to consider yourself a year from now. What does a more healed, healthy you look like? What might it look like for you to be a little bit bolder, a little bit more humbly confident in the character of God and a little freer when it comes to man's opinion. I think we need a vision before us constantly so we can continue to contend and walk in it. I want to end this segment with uh, pointing out, as you asked that question, what would a whole heal do you look like? That the book is a 10 week journey and it's experiential, which I love. It's not just information. And in each of the experiential sections, you have questions. And there was one uh, that was called a soul searching exercise. And you asked that question, what would a healed you look like? And I think that's an important question that we all assume we know. So, for example, your Lyme disease would go away or the reoccurrence of this inflammation. But it's that and something so much more because it's the lies and it's the accusations and it's the discouragement and all of the ways that uh, goodness is extinguished. So thank you for those exercises. Can we hit pause? And then I've got basically three more questions that if you have another 20 minutes, I'd like to do a second episode that we could release. Will that work for you? Absolutely. So thank you for listening to another episode of Restoring the Soul. We want you to know that Restoring the Soul is so much more than a podcast. What we're all about is helping couples and individuals get unstuck. You know how some people go to counseling or marriage therapy for months or even years and never really get anywhere? Our intensive programs help clients get unstuck in as little as two weeks. To learn more, visit RestoringTheSoul.com. That's RestoringTheSoul.com.